I, I think we are live. Um, I hope everyone can. Okay, that's great. Um, so hello, everyone. Welcome to our conversation series on One Health. My name is Erta Kalanji, and I am thrilled to moderate this discussion today. At One Health Trust, we are committed to bringing awareness to antimicrobial resistance. And as we approach Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week, are very excited to have with us colleagues and partners from the MAP Consortium uh, to bring awareness to antimicrobial resistance in Africa. The mapping of antimicrobial resistance and use partnership project, or MAP, uh, was a huge undertaking that was led by the African Society for Laboratory Medicine. And uh, its success, it's a result of pure dedication from all the partners involved and the 14 countries that, that shared the data uh, in order to bring light into um, this um, burden in Africa. Um, so everyone in the um, working in the MR space understands the challenge of, of um, developing policies um, that are country specific, but based on data that comes from a global scale. Um, in this context, the MAP project has provided a unique insight into uh, some of the challenges as well as the extent of AMR burden um, in the region. So our speakers today uh, will talk about this project, share some of the findings and what, what, um, what they actually mean for future AMR strategies. Um, at the end of the session, you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions directly, so feel free to um, add them to the Q&A section. I am uh, truly honored today um, to introduce our speakers, uh, whom you may already know from their uh, contribution to, to this cause. Um, so Dr. Yowanda Alimi from Africa Centers of um, for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, Edwin, Shumbra, Edwin Shumba from um, the African Society for Laboratory Medicine, and um, get Dr. Gitanjali Kapoor from One Health Trust. I will start with Edwin Shumba, who is the AMR Program Manager at the African um, Society for Laboratory Medicine, and has been instrumental in coordinating the activities uh, for the MAP Consortium. Um, Edwin, thank you so much for taking the time um, to, to join us today. I know that everybody in this, in this group has a very busy schedule with AMR Awareness, Awareness Week coming up. Um, could you please um, give our uh, broader audience um, an introduction to the MAP Consortium, how it came about, and perhaps talk about some of the major findings with regards to um, AMR surveillance uh, capacities in, in Africa? Uh, thank you very much, um, Eta. Uh, we are quite excited. Edwin, um, I believe you are on mute. You may be on mute. Hi, Eta. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, great. Um, apologies for that glitch. <laughs> so uh, as Eta indicated, my name is Edwin Shumba, uh, and I work with the African Society for Lab Medicine. And it is a pleasure to be sharing with you today, just a quick overview of what the MAP project is all about, uh, as well as sharing some results on the status of the AMR laboratory uh, network um, in 14 countries of um, Africa. So this is a journey that we uh, took for 36 months, and uh, we'll try to summarize uh, all that work in the next um, 10 minutes. So this work was funded by the Fleming Fund. Uh, as Eta indicated, this was an ASLM-led uh, consortium called the MAP Consortium, which um, had some strategic partners, the Africa CDC, where one day uh, one of our speakers comes from. Uh, we had EXA as well as WOW, who really were giving us that uh, support in terms of the traction that we needed in terms of engaging the countries. We also had some technical partners, uh, one, our health trust, which uh, was looking at the AMR data 
which my colleague Gita will really speak to, as well as Ikevia, who looked at the uh, AMC component of the data, as well as Instead, who were our technology partners, who developed the tools uh, that we're using for the data collection, as well as storage. So taking us through the map, we had a problem when we started back in 2019, where we said, look, in Africa, there is scarce data for large scale analysis. That was something that we knew. But in terms of why we didn't have this data, whether the data was not being generated or it was not being reported, it's something that we didn't know and we sought to explore um, in this work that we were doing uh, in the MAP project. Also, we knew that there was some data obviously within the countries, uh, but that data had not been exploited. What we didn't know at that time was that, is it because the data was inaccessible or it was the format in which the data was being stored or some other reason. So our objective then is the map um, consortium was then to collect uh, that retrospective data, digitize that data that we found uh, in a paper format, as well as then perform some analysis for both AMR and uh, AMC with uh, three key buckets of outcomes. The first bucket being around uh, understanding the AMR lab networks within these countries. So we wanted to measure what we call the surveillance readiness for AMR testing, as well as try to answer that question around the uh, gaps uh, in data generation and reporting. The second bucket uh, was mainly focusing on the AMR, which is establishing the baseline prevalence as well as trends for AMR in these 14 countries, understanding the drivers uh, as well as calculating a drug resistance uh, index. And the last bucket was around uh, the AMC where we then sought to uh, understand the uh, data surveillance feasibility as well as challenges around uh, collecting that AMC data as well as quantify and evaluate the trends uh, for the consumption of antibiotics across these countries. So I'm going to be focusing on the first bucket, which is the uh, lab networks as ETA indicated. So for us to have functional AMR networks that produce um, reliable data as well as uh, reporting representative and quality data, there are three things that we need to have in these networks. The first is around capability. We must have laboratories that are able to perform the uh, AMR testing, as well as have the capability to be able to report uh, the uh, AMR results. The second component is the population coverage. We should then be able to cover greater than 80% of the population for us to say our network is, is functioning pretty well. And then the last component is around quality. We then want to make sure that the data that is coming out of these labs uh, is following some quality standards and the labs are uh, implementing some quality management systems. So in the work that we were doing, uh, we then had to first of all understand how big these laboratory networks were uh, in the 14 countries where we were collecting data. So our entry point was then the antimicrobial resistance coordinating committees, which are the AMRCC. So with the leadership of our strategic partners, uh, EXA, WAHO, as well as Africa CDC, we're able then to engage these countries to better understand these lab networks as well as uh, plan for the subsequent data collection and analysis that we're going to do. So the first thing being the first thing, uh, data is the new gold now, we had to establish uh, data sharing agreements with the countries. So we are glad that we managed to establish those data sharing agreements between uh, ASLM and the countries. After that, we were then able to inventory the labs uh, within these countries. And as you can see from that uh, table, we inventory and found out that we are about 50,000 laboratories uh, on within those 14 countries. And uh, interestingly, there were some countries like Nigeria, your Tanzania, we had quite a lot of, of laboratories, Nigeria 34,000, Tanzania more than 6,000. But the bulk of the laboratories of the countries had laboratories in the 1,000 um, range. And there are a few countries that is very few labs uh, like um, your Gabon and Eswatini. 
So how did we then go about it coming from those 50,000 laboratories? We then uh, had to engage our MRCCs in the countries. We developed a questionnaire to be able now to assess the quality and capacity of, of these labs. For us then first to understand those gaps uh, and we calculated uh, our surveillance score to be able then also to see whether it's because of low reporting or uh, low testing. Thereafter, we then uh, had to select laboratories due to budget limitations, where we uh, wanted then to be able to collect data from a minimum of 16 laboratories uh, in each of these countries. So our questionnaire, which helped us to estimate that AMRA surveillance readiness had uh, six components, looking around the commodities and equipment, QMS uh, and accreditation, uh, the quality standardization of the ST execution, your human resources, specimen management, as well as information. We then calculated that score to then get what we termed a percent of AMRR readiness. So this just basically shows how we flowed from those 50,000 labs. Uh, as you can see, we ended up focusing on 393 uh, laboratories that then completed uh, the questionnaire that we shared with them. And we also collected some GIS uh, data. We then distilled based on the eligibility questionnaire to 205 uh, laboratories where we then collected uh, data for this study. As you can see from this um, um, pyramid, we had uh, about 70 laboratories sitting at the top, which were mainly our reference laboratories. And the bulk of our laboratories were within the intermediate and district levels, and just a few sitting at the bottom tier uh, of, of the tiered network. What we then found is that 80% uh, of the laboratories performed less than 1,000 AST tests in 2018 which then confirmed uh, or gave us an answer to one of the questions that we had at the beginning to say, is it because data is not being generated or it's not being re reported? So we realized from just this, that first of all, this is an issue of law testing um, across these 14 countries. We also then uh, found during this work that we're doing that there is a decreasing capacity as we go down the tiered, um, levels. As you can see from that uh, chart here, you see that the QMS activities, certification, accreditation, participation in EQA, till you get down to compliance with the uh, susceptibility testing standards, whether you see LSI or UCAS was decreasing as you came from the reference laboratories, which had a higher capacity. So we then found out that there is poor capacity uh, at the lower levels which then obviously undermines AMR surveillance, as we saw from the number of labs that are sitting within uh, those uh, lower tiers. So there is need for us then to be able to build mechanisms um, that help capacitate subnational level uh, laboratories so that they're able to contribute to AMR surveillance. Uh, we went on to also look at um, some of the geographical coverage uh, across these countries. So for the 16 laboratories that we then had to inventory, we tried to calculate a catchment area uh, that uh, one has to drive approximately an hour before they reach the facility uh, where they can get AST testing. So you can see from this that there's quite a low uh, population coverage for about seven of these countries, which is 50%, which you see that they are below 50% the laboratories that we inventoried. Uh, if you look at your Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, till you get to Sierra Leone. Uh, we also went on to say, let's look at uh, some of the work that is already going on in terms of uh, policy as well as strategic planning to say, how is it informing uh, AMR control? And what we saw was that, um, lab issues are not sufficiently addressed in the national action plans. Uh, if you look at uh, this graph that's showing, you find that uh, less than 10 interventions are laboratory specific when you then uh, compare with the other interventions that are within the uh, NAPs for the different countries. 
So we really need to start thinking around how do we increase the coverage as well as the capacity of bacteriology testing laboratories since we have less than 10% of the interventions focusing uh, on, on, on the laboratories. So I think as we uh, get into the antimicrobial awareness week, we want to start thinking around how do we review our NAPs to be able to have more interventions that are targeting laboratories so that we're able to generate uh, enough data for surveillance. So in summary, uh, what, what we saw is that when we started with those 50,000 laboratories across the 14 countries, we found that 1.3% of the laboratories were actually performing bacteriology testing at that time, uh, which is 2016 to 2019, which is quite low. We need to start thinking about how do we then increase uh, this 1.3% to maybe 50% where we have half of the laboratories within a, a country uh, performing uh, AMR testing. Uh, for these surveyed laboratories, you find that 44% of them were using paper-based systems. So that also starts uh, to, to bring that thought in us to say, do we need then to digitize and have electronic systems uh, within our microbiology laboratories. 80% of the labs performed less than 1,000 tests per year, which is low, and very few labs, 23%, we are accredited. So what is our take-home message uh, from all this work that we did in the 36 months? Lesson number one is that very few labs in the national laboratory networks are actually conducting bacteriology testing. So there is no equitable distribution of bacteriology testing within the countries. So as policymakers, we now need to start thinking, how do we ensure that bacteriology testing is equitable? The second, the volume of testing is very low. So that is a consequence on the representativeness of the surveillance data that we are looking at within uh, the country, as well as the access to bacteriology testing. So access is, is a key word. We need to uh, increase the access to bacteriology testing. Uh, thirdly, uh, you would find that most of these laboratories do not participate in EQA, and uh, most of them used those paper-based uh, systems. So that has a consequence, obviously, on the reliability of the results that are coming from these labs. So we need to ensure that more and more labs participate in EQA, and they also uh, update the LIS systems that they are using. Uh, that higher AMR testing capacity that we saw at the reference level needs to trickle down now to the lower tiers. And then lastly, our national action plans do not sufficiently address uh, lab strengthening initiatives. And that is a homework for all of us. So with that, I want to thank the participating countries, the ministries of health, the AMRCCs that really worked tirelessly with us in the 36 months, as well as uh, our partners, our PI, Dr. Pascal Londoa, uh, as well as Anya, uh, who really supported us throughout this work. And a special thanks goes to our funders uh, for this uh, support that we have. So with that, colleagues, I want to thank you. Thank you, Edwin, for this uh, very good presentation. Uh, I think the, the visuals and the graphs you presented um, uh, told a very, uh, interesting story. Um, I, th I think this is a problem. The problem with AMR surveillance capacity is not uh, limited to, to African countries. It's a problem that is at large, but um, it, is, um, it is an amazing initiative to actually provide actual evidence on, on where the, the bottlenecks or the gaps are in order to address them. So um, with uh, saying that, uh, I'd like to ask the next uh, set of question to um, Dr. Gitanjali Kapoor uh, from One Health Trust. Gita, thank you very much for, for joining today. Um, Gita is the director of the India office at One Health Trust, and um, she has led the, the MAP data, AMR data analysis uh, package uh, um, and um, has uh, some some additional insights to present uh, to us today. So um, 
Gita, the, the, the audience is really curious to know uh, some more insights into the AMR burden and perhaps some potential drivers that may be driving this resistance in the countries that you surveyed. Sure. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Ota. And uh, let me share my screen. Right, so uh, we will not go over uh, what has already been mentioned by my colleague, uh, Edwin. We'll go straight to uh, the main findings. So uh, we all know this project was called as the MAP, which is an acronym for Mapping AMR and AMU Partnership. And the focus of uh, my presentation is basically going to be around the antimicrobial resistance component, the first A of the map. That's going to be the focus of uh, my presentation on behalf of the One Health Trust. Uh, I think all of us know that One Health Trust was previously called as CDDEP or CDEP. And the slide has already been shown before by Edwin, which talks about our funders on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you can see all the different partners, including uh, African um, Society of uh, Lab Medicine, as well as um, the uh, other partners. So uh, these objectives were also mentioned by Edwin. And as I mentioned, I would be basically focusing on the middle part. You can see the red box here on the antimicrobial resistance related uh, outcomes. So we basically had three different uh, objectives or outcomes which we were interested in in this study. We were keen to look into baseline AMR prevalence and trends, the drivers of AMR, or maybe let's say the potential drivers of AMR, and a very interesting indicator called as the drug resistance index. So I'll go uh, into all these three. Now on this slide, what we are giving first of all is as where Edwin stopped last was, he mentioned that 205 labs uh, were selected for data collection across the 14 countries in Africa. So let us look into just, you know, to understand what kind of uh, a contribution we got from the different countries. So on the left-hand side, you can see we have 14 countries. Uh, you would see they are like ordered in a very random way. Well, it's not like that. Uh, the first uh, six are basically from the Western Central, arranged alphabetically. The next uh, three, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, are from East. And the last four are from Southern Africa. And that's how we would be showing across in all the graphs. So uh, we had uh, the maximum contributing uh, labs were from Nigeria. We had about 25 labs uh, from that country. And from the rest, we had about 16. So we actually, in the beginning, we thought that we'll, we'll take just 16 labs from each country. And that's what basically happened. But from very small sized countries like Iswatini and Sierra Leone, we had lesser number of uh, labs contributing, which is also logical. And on the right hand side, what we are showing is how many actual cultures were collected uh, on field uh, in each of these countries. So as you can see, we, we were very close to about 1 million culture results in all, and uh, about a, close to a quarter of those 1 million cultures were positive cultures with AST results, which we know in the labs, I think most of the lab professionals, we know that about 20 to 25% of cultures normally tested turn out to be positive. So we came somewhere close to that also. And uh, again, the contribution number of cultures which came from each country also was uh, varied. Uh, from some countries like Cameroon, we had an, a lot of cultures, uh, which were uh, results came from a lot of cultures. And from smaller labs like Sierra Leone, uh, lesser number of culture results were available for further analysis. Now over here, we are trying to show uh, what exactly when we say that we were close to 1 million culture in this circle, you see that so precisely it was about 819 eight, eight, thousand cultures total and uh, about 60 percent of those cultures were invalid or they were like uh, negative there was uh, not much uh, much really to do with those they were filtered out we could not take it for analysis but if you look into this green colored uh, uh, 
bit, the green colored segment. So that's that's telling about what was of interest to us. So that was about 23% uh, of these total cultures, which were positive, and it had the ASD results. Now I'm going back to uh, the bigger umbrella that was when we were close to about a million cultures, 819,000 cultures. Uh, the contribution which came from the different labs, it was varied. And uh, again, we had maximum number of cultures which came from Cameroon and very little came from smaller countries like Sierra, uh, Gabon, Ghana, and uh, East Watini. And again, if you look into the distribution in each of these circles, for example, if I pick up Cameroon, then you can see that uh, we had uh, about, again, more than 60% were negative, and uh, we had about maybe 20% which were positive cultures with AST results. It was a similar story in most of the countries. Now, uh, I'm going to the the segment of interest, which is about uh, 0.18 million cultures, which were positive with ASD results. This is what this slide is showing. And we have shown individually for each of the countries in this particular uh, graph on the left. And on the right, it's a collation from all the countries. And what we see is most of uh, these positive cultures, what kind of samples gave uh, positive growth? It basically came from urine, purulent samples and blood. So on the right hand side, what you can see is, uh, and, and we have the legends over here. So these were the three and in, in the laboratories, uh, we know these are the most commonly uh, cultured and also most common samples which turn out to be positive. So that's that was the distribution like. Coming to what kind of pathogens were isolated from these positive cultures. So again, let's focus on the circle on the right. Uh, on the left, of course, it's country-wise, and I don't think we'll have that kind of time right now to go through each country. So if you look into the composite picture, uh, we had uh, a lot. In fact, most of uh, our uh, positive uh, cultures, the pathogen that was isolated was, if you see that blue color, it was uh, Staph aureus. So this was Staph aureus. Most and then, of course, we had enterobacterials that uh, was E. coli and Klebsiella. And uh, rest of it, we have clubbed in in this gray color. So these were the three most commonly uh, isolated pathogens from the cultures which were positive. We also looked into uh, the lab's uh, data quality and the country's data quality uh, through a very objective uh, methodology. And uh, it uh, it ranged from zero to four, as you can see on the left hand side, you'll see every country has a number at the end. And uh, most of the countries, they had a reasonably good uh, data quality score at the country level. Uh, zero indicated a low uh, scoring and four indicated a high scoring. So it was basically one to four. And uh, the smaller countries, they had uh, the data quality on the lower side. Of course, uh, there were reasons. Uh, we did not go into all that because this was uh, this was not an exploratory study. Well, that can be considered maybe at a later point of time, but it was interesting to know that reasonably most of the countries did, did produce data of good quality. And uh, what did we do basically with that point, uh, 0.18 million uh, positive cultures? We looked into the AMR rates. What was the resistance rates for different kinds of pathogens? We followed a well-defined methodology uh, as per the CLSI M39A4. And, uh, and the confidence interval was also uh, estimated for the AMR rates through a, through a Wilson cluster robust method, which was actually, um, uh, again, uh, by uh, Dr. Erta uh, and um, Dr. Ailey Klein. So they had, in fact, uh, also authored a paper on this uh, based on this particular uh, study. We looked into the AMR rates for uh, the primary objective was to look for uh, the bacterial priority pathogens, the BPPL. And uh, we covered all these 14 different pathogens. But you know, when we analyzed it, what we saw is that uh, the countries did not have enough data. And for most countries, the rates could be estimated for only five of these 15 combinations. And uh, these have been highlighted in blue. And now in the next few slides, I will be going into what kind of resistance did we see for these five pathogens. 
Now we begin with the first one, which was a critical uh, pathogen as per the WHO, the carbapenem resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And as I had mentioned uh, on the left-hand side, we are showing the country-wise uh, picture. And uh, why do we have these uh, four different rectangles? Every rectangle signifies the year. So 2016, right on the top, 2017 in the middle, 18. For some countries, we also had data from 2019. And so we have, we have that also shown. Uh, primarily, this was a historical uh, study, as Edwin had mentioned. So we all are data that came to us for analysis was from previously collected uh, results. And uh, what, what we saw is that overall, the resistance rate for this group of pathogen hovered around 25 to 40% in most of the countries. So in eight out of 14, we saw it was in this range. And specifically, of course, each of the countries has been provided with a country report and uh, and details can be looked into over there. But this is pretty high considering that this is a very important and a nosocomial pathogen. It has a lot of implications on the clinical side. Uh, we know these infections are fatal. And we also know that uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa will get carbapenem resistant if it is exposed a lot to this particular uh, antibiotic. Uh, and when does this happen? This happens, of course, when there's a prolonged antibiotic uh, usage or extended stay in the hospital, uh, patient is on device for a long time, he has some underlying comorbidities, especially cystic fibrosis in respiratory patients, patients of burn, et cetera. So uh, how do we kind of control this, which I would be showing on the next slide, is that we, uh, it's no rocket science. We all know that these infections can be uh, mitigated, they can be contained if very basic uh, prevention and containment measures are followed, uh, not specifically for just this uh, bacteria, but across all the different bacteria, which I'll be talking about. Uh, simple standard precautions of hand hygiene, uh, not putting the catheter for beyond the stipulated time, early device removal, and of course, in the hospital also following the stewardship practices and infection control programs need to be really uh, well implemented. So uh, this was about the first uh, critical uh, pathogen. Then coming to the other one, we also saw that uh, the rates were high uh, for the carbapenem resistant enterobacterials. It was around uh, less than 25%, but still for some countries, like for Ghana, you can see the bar goes really high. Uh, but overall, in the rest of the countries, most of the countries, it was less than 25%. Uh, but yes, it can always be on the higher side if you see it after. This is historical data, so it has a scope of increasing if it's not contained on time. The implications are pretty much similar as for uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, of course, the kinds of patients which uh, normally get infected with this are not the same as it happens for pseudomonas infections, uh, not really for burns patients, uh, not really for uh, patients with cystic fibrosis, we know that. But overall, yes, for patients who are in the hospital for too long, uh, they are catheterized or they are on any device, they could be transplant patients or, or patients with any underlying comorbidities. So uh, where do we uh, kind of, and how do we mitigate uh, these infections? And uh, the principles remain the same. Uh, the principles go by, again, your standard precautions and contact precautions, including hand hygiene and training the nursing staff about uh, washing hands between you change uh, from one patient to the other. And I think that would also be emphasized in this World Antibiotic Awareness Week. Uh, compliance to uh, infection prevention uh, practices is, um, again, a very simple uh, measure that needs to be adopted, but it has uh, ramifying effects if it's uh, implemented. And stewardship practices and seeing to it that the antimicrobials are prescribed only as and when needed and tailored uh, immediately when you have uh, results from the lab and a diagnosis is there. We also looked, looked into uh, the rates for uh, the third generation cephalosporin resistant enterobacterials, very high, more than 50% in most of the countries. You can see the orange bar going really high uh, for all the 14 countries. And for Sierra Leone, we did not have, you'll see a blank over here. So we did not have data for Sierra Leone, but for rest of the countries, we had the data and it was typically uh, above the 50% bar. So 50% is here. It's mostly going above 50% in most of the countries. 
for all the three years. So again, cause of concern, and it just shows that, well, if we don't uh, take measures today, uh, it's going to be a bad pandemic or a bad tsunami in the future, in fact, in the very near future. The other fourth pathogen uh, from the WHO group for which we uh, got uh, the higher AMR rates was MRSA, um, more than 40% in most of the countries. And uh, we know MRSA is causing just not uh, community acquired, but also nosocomial infections. It's uh, causing just not skin and soft tissue infections. Those staff does stay on the skin, but it, it also causes other invasive infections like endocarditis and uh, pneumonias, abscesses, shunt infections, et cetera. And uh, risk factors are again there. Of why do you catch MRSA? Uh, we know it could be because a patient is already colonized and he was perhaps not decolonized before his procedure. He uh, was already exposed to methicillin, a group of drugs. It could be a post-surgical state, dialysis patients, et cetera. So uh, where and how do we mitigate this infection? And uh, again, the principles pretty much remain the same. Uh, but in addition to MRSA, what we can add is that the high-risk patients or the patients who are going for uh, any kind of a surgery, uh, especially uh, device uh, insertion, their preoperative uh, tests and screening is very important. And if they are already harboring MRSA, they need to be decolonized. So uh, this was uh, uh, interesting to find that we, we are really, um, we need to do a lot if we need to prevent uh, these infections from expanding in the future. The last uh, bug uh, from the WHO list for which we got the uh, high AMR rates was chloroquinolone resistant uh, salmonella species. It was more than 25 25% uh, in about four to five uh, countries. Not all, we did not get data for this uh, pathogen from most, most of the countries, but we got from five out of the 14 countries. And we know salmonella does cause enteric fever. It also causes various other infections, especially uh, the non-typhoidal strains. So, uh, so considering all these things and looking into the risk factors, uh, for harboring these infections, such as uh, schistosomiasis, immunocompromised state, uh, extremes of age, malaria, uh, chronic liver disease. These are uh, the kinds of patients which usually come up with this infection. And of course, overexposure to fluoroquinolones today has, uh, has made this a global concern because this is one of the last resort drugs, uh, fluoroquinolone, macrolides, and, uh, and cephalosporins which uh, we were resorting to, but mostly all these three are now uh, showing up very high resistance. So what do we do in this particular combination? We need to uh, immediately take uh, action. Uh, food and water safety has to be stepped up. Uh, we need to screen the food handlers for chronic uh, carrier state. Vaccinations need to be given, especially we know typhoid vaccines exist, so they have to be uh, given for prevention. and. Um, and uh, the use of the antibiotic has to be restricted, not just in hospitals, but also on the animal husbandry side. And uh, patients need to be told about the importance of completing their antibiotics uh, so uh, the infection can be eradicated and there is very less chance of any relapse. We also looked into uh, two more objectives. We looked into the drivers of resistance and uh, the drug resistance index. So uh, I, I hope we have the time. Ota, do we have the time to go over this? Uh, perhaps uh, briefly, Gita, perhaps. Okay. Uh... Okay, we have, so, we have five more minutes. <clears throat> all right, so I'll just round it up quickly. Uh, we looked into AMR drivers, which were done at two levels, the patient level and the country level. At the patient level, we looked into uh, the patient demographics, age, gender, diagnosis, comorbidities, it's there on the left-hand side. And mostly we did see, uh, we applied the uh, multiple logistic regression to see if any particular age uh, is predisposed to resistant infections. And in all, every country had a very different uh, scenario. But if you look into Burkina Faso, right on the top, you see that patients who were elderly more than 50 years of age, they were 1.3 times more likely 
to uh, harbor uh, or to acquire resistant infections as compared to patients younger than that. And likewise, every country was different. We also saw in some countries infants, that means less than one year of age uh, uh, group, they also had a very high risk of catching resistant infections. Moving to, uh, I'll be skipping this slide in the interest of time, but I'll be coming to drug resistance index, which was actually, uh, it's a very important indicator and uh, it was uh, developed by our own organization by Dr. Raman and Lakshmi Narayan. And uh, it's a very interesting indicator. Uh, we looked into this, uh, it ranges from zero to 100. And what does it mean? It basically means if the DRI for, uh, for the group of pathogens we are looking at, if it's zero, AMR is not really a problem. But if it's 100, it is a serious problem. And uh, this is a very simple metric. It's an indicator which just tells aggregate rate of resistance uh, across a wide number of antibiotics and pathogens. So you can see the speedometer here, 0 to 100. And uh, anything above 100 is, an, is shown in red. It's an alarm. Uh, what we saw, you can see on the right-hand side, most of the countries, they were above 50%. So it's a cause of concern. How do we say that? Because if you look into USA, which we have kept over here, it's very less. It's just about 18%. But if you look into the other developing countries out of Africa, like Argentina and India, even that's very high. So yes, generally, um, it's, a, it's a, like a litmus test. It's important for the policymakers because they'll not understand all the different signs that we talk about, but if you tell them it's DRI 50%, 60%, it strikes a bell, well, that's a cause of concern and we must do something. We also looked into AMR drivers at the country level and uh, various socioeconomic indicators were considered. Uh, in general, we saw that when uh, the education or the socioeconomics level of that country, the GDP, uh, the physician density, et cetera, was better was higher, the DRI was lesser. So you see the slope of this line is falling down. Uh, but if the consumption, uh, if you see this bottom left, if the, the drug um, consumption is high, the DDD is high, uh, the DRI also is high. So this was done by Pearson's correlation analysis. And uh, we, uh, we definitely need to look into improving the AMR prevention scores at each country and improving their socioeconomic uh, indices. So with this, I would actually uh, maybe end the, um, end the, uh, the session, but I'll be happy to take up any questions in, in the chat box or separately. Thanking everybody who uh, contributed for this, uh, which has already been mentioned by uh, my colleague Edwin. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. This was a very, very interesting presentation and um, very much anticipated by many uh, who are working uh, in, in, in the field, especially in Africa. Um, given the, the time to keep up with time, I think um, we will we will proceed with um, with our last speaker for today, um, Dr. Yvanda Alimi, who is um, who is uh, an AMR One Health and AMR coordinator at Africa um, CDC, and um, has a unique perspective on what this data actually means. Um, as the previous speakers mentioned. Um, the MAP project was looking at both AMR and AMU, so antimicrobial use. For the purpose of time, we are unable to go into details in that part of the data. But uh, Yuande is going to present a couple of slides that are going to um, give a little bit of an insight on antimicrobial use and access um, in, in the region. But most importantly, Yuande, thank you very much for joining us, us today. Um, and uh, would you be able to, to uh, share your perspective with the audience on how these findings can be translated into policy that can um, that can help contain AMR in um, African countries and, and beyond. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks to the One Health team uh, uh, 
want to trust team for putting this together and to the speakers who have uh, very much uh, done a fantastic job uh, in showcasing uh, some of these findings. Uh, but you would ask me, what does this really mean to us as a continent? Uh, what does this really mean uh, for our interventions? And I'm hoping that I would be able to uh, um, sort of tie in the findings uh, from this um, important initiative and probably unpack areas where we as a continent uh, I need to really focus on. And so um, um, Edwin and uh, Gitter have done a fantastic job uh, sort of highlighting uh, what we call the crisis within the crisis. We say this because, as you know, uh, the continent experiences several other outbreaks and uh, their very limited resources. Uh, as much as we have imagined AML to be a silent pandemic, I disagree because it's right there in our faces. Uh, concerning findings uh, from the Gram study, uh, just estimating some of the um, so, sort of the highest mortality uh, from AMR infection in the world uh, with 27.3 um, deaths per uh, 100,000 attributable to AMR from the continent. Um, um, we've also highlighted some um, um, very concerning uh, findings, such as the fact that uh, 12 uh, African countries are reporting a score higher than 25%. Uh, this is where we say we need to ring the alarm. It's not as silent as we think it is. Um, most importantly, we thought to highlight also the concerning um, um, sort of uh, gaps around access versus excess. Uh, um, in this work that we did, we highlighted that um, at least 80% of the total drug consumption across all the 14 countries uh, by access drugs, um, all are, um, um, it's just one country that is in line uh, with the WHO recommendation. And very nicely, I'd like to show you um, um, where we have taken a step back to understand how do we then find the balance? Um, the issues around access uh, for essential medicines versus the use excess, uh, which many of us will know um, from open uh, a sort of a chemist um, um, prescription, um, um, being able to get your uh, antibiotics or antimicrobials off the counter. In our findings, we highlight that um, uh, if you look at the access uh, um, sort of um, the access category, um, only two percent of the countries really have um, uh, this on their national essential medicines list, as well as um, re rather concerning findings with the watch reserve um, 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 antimicrobials uh, as defined by the WHO, WHO's essential medicine list. But one of the things that is mostly concerning for us is many of the antibiotics uh, documented in these 14 countries are not ideally, uh, are not on the WHO essential medicines list. It means that all of the, many of the antibiotics that are used are not the preferred or the recommended antibiotics uh, 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 um, by the global bodies. Again, a lot of things for us to consider as a continent, and most importantly, it drives how we use data for policy. So implications for AMR containment strategies. And I think I, I, I would not be making this presentation on behalf of myself, uh, but when we launched this data um, in September 2022, one of the crucial things is we had a, an interesting, a very insightful uh, sort of brainstorming session with the 14 member states. And many of the recommendations I will be highlighting have, has really come from our AU member states. And we hope that many of this will be cascaded across Across the other African Union member states. One of the things I start off with is more testing, less talking. It's rather concerning that and, um, Africa as a continent at the moment um, across these 14 countries, which we can, we can relatively say is quite reflective of the challenges across the continent, is our current level using the data from MAP is really at 1.3% for current testing. Ideally, we need to progressively increase the numbers of laboratory that can provide AML data in Africa to at least 50% of the laboratory capacity. It's also important as we develop and revise our national um, AML national action plans, we really reflect some of this fine, some of the gaps as identified, such as the quality of data, uh, the capacity of data in, our, in the national laboratory strategic uh, plans. 
As you know, on the continent, many um, healthcare providers are really private uh, laboratories or healthcare facilities. It's important that we, we have our national systems um, um, speaking very closely or very in line with the private laboratories as well as uh, private healthcare providers. Uh, we as Africa CDC, as, as well as um, other um, technical partners uh, from the map are really keen to work with countries to build a, a, a specimen referral uh, system that can really uh, support uh, the progressive increase of bacteriology. Uh, there are several initiatives uh, uh, that are already being funded across the continent that we strongly advocate that many more countries uh, uh, sign up to at uh, the leadership of the African Union, as well as our member states, start to look at initiatives, uh, continental or regional initiatives, uh, such as EQA uh, Africa, uh, to boost quality assurance processes. Um, but most importantly, you'd agree with me that um, there's no one size fits all when, we when it comes to AMR. Um, quite all right, we're able to estimate on the human health side, but we mustn't forget that we really need to embrace a one health approach where we look at AMR, um, antimicrobial use and consumption um, in animal health as well as agriculture sectors. Data for action. As much as we are pleased um, 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 to really launch this groundbreaking findings, it is, I think one thing that is most critical to Africa CDC is how can we then use these findings to support our AU member states uh, to, to, to drive policy, to drive in interventions and to drive domestic financing. As many more countries are, are going through the process of revising and costing their national AMR action plans, um, it's important for them to really reflect on these findings. A lot of gaps have been identified, at least um, primarily in the laboratory systems, uh, when you think about the stewardship programs as well, as well as access to antimicrobials. Uh, so it's important that countries really reflect some of these recommendations and gaps in uh, the revision of their NAPs. As you've seen, uh, we have really concerning findings, uh, particularly when it comes to access. Um, um, more than ever, we really need our member states uh, to work on updating the national essential medicines list. Uh, we did a, a bit of work a, a while back, I think in 2019, and it was quite concerning that um, some of the countries that had updated were as far back as 2010 uh, for their national um, treatment guidelines. Um, as much as possible, we want countries to have um, evidence or data that can really drive uh, their interventions or how the directions they move towards their stewardship programs. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and we are really glad as the Africa Union that we have the African Medicines Agency uh, uh, that has been ratified that is going to go into full action. You would know that we deal with issues around substandard falsified medicines, but most important, um, um, access when it comes to uh, being able to purchase um, antimicrobials uh, that require prescription just off the counter. Uh, so there's several um, measures that we need to take as a continent to really improve uh, this methodology. Most importantly, an all systems approach as well as leveraging regionalism is what we really uh, strongly advocate for. We need to expand, consolidate the number capacity of AML surveillance sentinel sites. Um, one of the things um, Edwin had, had really highlighted is how to digitalize that data. Uh, beyond digitalizing the data, also thinking about things like um, um, unique patient identifiers so that we are able to link laboratory data with clinical data as well as health outcomes. Africa CDC, as well as uh, several other um, continental partners, have done a remarkable work uh, to lever to build regional public health networks and think about laboratories and shared infrastructure. Um, COVID was a, an eye-opening experience for all of us, and now we know it definitely can work. So one of the things that we are really pushing forward is that regional integrated surveillance and laboratory network as well as leveraging um, the Pathogen um, Genomic Institute initiative um, that has provided um, more, um, um, genomic uh, capacity to more than 47 countries, as well as uh, the Fleming Fund uh, SEC Africa um, Regional Initiative. Um, we're also working very closely uh, for a use case to really use sort of the COVID capacity that is already on the continent and how we can use AMR as a use case. 
Um, we also are really would like um, 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 to really adapt the list of the WHO parity pathogens and really to focus on the epidemiology of Africa. Money does make the world go round and our recommendations um, for um, financing is really crucial. And many of the gaps, you would agree with me that as much as we might be passionate, uh, we might have the evidence, we might have the data, if the money is not there, there's literally nothing that can be done. Um, so with these findings, we really believe that it would give national governments as well as regional and continental governments an idea of how much more investment we need for health in Africa. We recall that the Abuja Declaration had made a certain benchmark, um, but upon review, many countries are not even able to get to that benchmark. So it's important that co countries start to look inward to see how to mobilize our domestic financing that can improve uh, some of these um, 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 gaps that have been identified. As AMR experts, one of the key challenges that we experience is our inability to really advocate um, in terms of numbers uh, to policymakers. But we, we argue that um, um, with findings like this, with having granular data, AMR data such as this, countries can start to build an economic case for AMR containment, not just at the national level, but also at a regional and continental level. We mustn't forget that, um, again, looking at the lessons from COVID, Involving the private sector, the regional economic communities, industry, as well as philanthropic organizations can really take us a long way. As much as money makes the world go round, we must look at low cost interventions or cost effective measures that are right in front of us. Um, a few I would like to highlight is really around investment in vaccinations, our provisions of clean water, sanitation, and, and hygiene, as well as other IPC measures. I know that um, we definitely have a lot of global um, partners on the call, but as a continent, I think um, more than ever, uh, particularly on AMR, this um, we are hoping that the uh, during the uh, World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, we will really be able to put a spotlight on the continent. But there really needs to be more global initiatives and investments uh, coming to the continent to really support um, antimicrobial resistance interventions. Um, on that note, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much to our Africa Union member states who have been uh, um, um, a part of the MAP initiative, as well as our technical and strategic partners of the MAP initiatives, and most importantly, of course, our funders uh, who have really uh, made this uh, come to light. Over to you um, to continue the session. Thank you very much, uh, Wandi. This um, these have been some really good presentations, and um, I can see by the questions that um, our audience is asking um, that this this presentation has been very timely. Uh, a lot of you are asking about um, about about uh, these presentations, and we have shared a brief uh, on the chat. Uh, it's the brief that uh, Africa CDC launched um, a couple of. Uh, perhaps a month or two earlier. So um, have a look at that brief and um, keep an eye for, for these uh, findings. They will come out, uh, there, there will be a publication or, or two coming out uh, soon, I'm sure. Um, in the meantime, um, I see that um, our speakers have answered quite a few questions. For the sake of time, um, we are not able to have a uh, to answer all of them, but there's a, a few left that perhaps uh, we can attempt uh, for the next five minutes. Uh, one of them is um, regarding, and this is open to, to everyone, but it's regarding um, laboratories um, in this project, um, leveraging COVID-19 infrastructure in order to uh, facilitate future AMR surveillance effort. And I just summarized the question to make it quicker. Um, any of the speakers has any comment on this? Is there, is that going on? I'm assuming it must be. Have, the, have these labs, um, have these lab, labs increased in their capacity for, for AMR surveillance following the COVID-19 pandemic response? Well, it's difficult to answer because we haven't uh, gone back to the labs uh, after the project, but Gita, you were yeah. about to comment yeah. on that. Yeah, I think what I can just add is that overall the quality management uh, systems 
what was used for uh, building up the COVID labs, at least the basic principles remain the same. So that part can be leveraged onto the bacteriology labs also. And to ensure that there is a reagent uh, supply 24 seven, there are other important, uh, um, uh, the equipment, everything is running uh, well, that there is capacity uh, of uh, the, the staff, they are trained well. So the basic principles which we have in the LQMS lab quality management systems, which was applied for COVID uh, labs that can always be, uh, it, and it was always there, it's not nothing new, but at least we realize the importance of things can happen very fast if there is a willpower and if there is leadership. So this part can definitely help us in, in the long run. So there's a question about affordability um, from Mwapundahi saying, I agree that enhancing lab capacity is key, but how do we make it affordable, especially in the animal health sector? Um, I wonder if the question is affordable to people or affordable to the, the countries to upgrade um, the, the facilities. Okay, the question. So again, this, uh, I mean, if we think of it, if we talk of affordability in testing, uh, it may be difficult, of course, to suddenly expand in every nook and corner of uh, the country, but uh, there are systems uh, like you can, you can send the samples to the reference lab and over there, you know, we have high quality testing. So that kind of system can be worked out uh, and those labs can mentor the smaller lab. So, so various approaches can be adapted while, uh, while there is more budget to uh, full-fledgedly improve and expand labs at, uh, at a complete uh, comprehensive level. So uh, there can be middle parts which can be worked up. And of course, I think if uh, the policymakers are, uh, are there with, uh, with the professionals and there is a good teamwork and there is an understanding, they know that when you invest in such things, it it really helps in, in the overall burden and overall expenses, it's, it's so cost effective in the long run. So I think that idea has to percolate down uh, amongst the policymakers also for, for greater funding. I'm not sure if they, this typically answers the question, but yes, it, I think it just, it hits, hits it somewhere. Uh, and, and Kita, I believe one more question. Um, is there a list, one of the, uh, someone from the audience, uh, uh, Birgitta Gleason is asking if there is a list of priority pathogens from Africa, specific to Africa. I... Is there a no, list currently available? No, I, I don't, don't think, think so. No, but, no yeah. not yet. So, uh, uh, Wendy or Edwin, you can maybe add on over here. Yeah, I was going to jump in to say at the moment, of course, uh, we are very much aligned uh, with the WHO uh, uh, priority pathogen list. And one of the crucial things um, uh, this work has really done is uh, identifying the fact that many countries are not testing uh, for some of the pathogens on that list. Uh, so I think um, the future of um, the continent is really where we are able to uh, sort of estimate all the, uh, the, 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 the burden, the trends of various pathogens based on context. As you know, the continent is quite diverse uh, across the 55 member states. This will then give us an, uh, an opportunity to be able to document it. But at the moment, of course, uh, the continent is very much aligned uh, with the WHO uh, piracy pathogen list. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, with this, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around. I see a great number of people still uh, listening to the end of this uh, webinar. Thank you for thank you very much to our speakers who um, really had to uh, manage their time in a very busy, very busy time of the year, especially for those working in the AMR field uh, with the AMR Awareness Week coming up uh, and so many other projects. So uh, thank you again if you'd like to revisit the recording of this webinar uh, you can um, find it later in a few days uh, in our website at onehealthtrust.org um, so thank you everybody and um, have a have a great day thank you Otto. thank you everyone bye-bye thanks thank Martin. you bye-bye